Hello, and welcome to the third event, a panel discussion in our series, Those Who Feed Us, a webinar series exploring migrant farm workers, health disparities, and digital inclusion for better health. I'm Heidi Reese, and I'm the liaison librarian to the Brody School of Medicine at East Carolina University's Lopez Health Sciences Library. I'm going to turn it over briefly to Angie and Mercado to explain the interpretation options before we get started. Thank you. Yes, good morning to everybody. My name is Angie and I'm going to be interpreting together with Murtado Bustillo. And today we're presenting Full Circle Interpreting. We are happy to be with you today. It was very important for the organizers of this event to make sure that this was a bilingual space in which Spanish speakers could also fully hear and understand what is being said. So please bear with me for just one moment while I make a quick announcement in Spanish about interpretation. Hola, muy buenos días a todos. Estamos ofreciendo servicios de interpretación el día de hoy. Eh, en, van a encontrar en pantalla las instrucciones de cómo conectar. Si están en un computador, eh, ustedes van a ver un símbolo redondo que aparece como un mundo. Presionan ese botoncito y luego se van a ir para español. Si están utilizando un teléfono o una tableta, esas opciones de interpretación están ubicados abajo a mano derecha. Van a encontrar tres puntitos presionan esos tres puntitos, luego se van a ir a Language Interpretation o Interpretación de Idioma, luego seleccionan Español y luego ponen Done o Finalizar para poder escuchar en español. Muchísimas gracias. Les recordamos que en el Chromebook no funciona la interpretación, así que por favor procuren eh, conectarse con un computador o teléfono inteligente. Muchas gracias y que disfruten la sesión de hoy. Thank you, Heidi. I have gone ahead and made the announcement about interpreting services. Thanks so much, Angie. So our event today is a panel discussion around digital equity and why digital inclusion affects health outcomes. We hope you enjoy the program today and were able to attend the previous events in the series. We'd also like to thank our partners from the Lopez Health Sciences Library Diversity Committee, the NC Farmworker Health Program, ECU College of Health and Human Performance, Student Action with Farmworkers, and the NC State Agro Medicine Extension for arranging and hosting these webinars with us. These partners are in their third year of working together with the support from the National Library of Medicine to improve the daily lives of migrant and seasonal farm workers by expanding internet connectivity and access to online health information. Before we begin, we're gonna give a land acknowledgement so we acknowledge the Tuscarora and Catawba people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live. We honor these tribes by recognizing that our institutions were built on land stolen from those who were here before colonizers arrived. We pay respect to the eight recognized tribes, Gohari, Eastern Band of Cherokee, Haliwasaponi, Lumbee, Meharan, Okadichi, Band of Saponi, Sapani, Wikma Suen, all nations and their elders, past, present, and emerging. Additionally, this land has borne witness to over 400 years of enslavement, torture, and systematic mistreatment of African people and their descendants. We must acknowledge the history of our spaces and the places that we occupy to both understand and unlearn the many ways that we have been socialized. Just to give you some tech instructions, as you can see on the image, you have the ability to ask a question in the Q&A box located at the bottom or top of your Zoom screen. Your questions will be sent to the panelists and moderators and once answered available for you to see for everybody else. The language interpretation feature will either be a button next to the Q&A or it's located by clicking on the more. Finally, you can exit the webinar at any time by clicking on the red leave button on the left. Now I'm going to introduce our moderator and panelists for today. Our moderator is Paula Acevedo, an undergraduate research assistant in the Department of Health, Education and Promotion at East Carolina University. She has been working on research with the National Library of Medicine 
Health Disparities Resources Grant at ECU that focuses on health literacy and digital inclusion from farm workers. Our first panelist is Rosa Miranda, and Rosa Miranda is the CHW Coordinator for Surrey Medical Ministries. She holds a bachelor's in rural studies concentrating in social and community development and a master's of science and sociology. Rosa has been working in healthcare outreach for 10 years, always working with the underserved and underrepresented communities, including migrant and seasonal farm workers in Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina. Rosa was born in Mexico City and migrated to the US at age 13. She is the mother of a beautiful toddler, Frida. Our next panelist is Jessica Rodriguez, uh, the Farm Worker Health Program Manager at Vecinos. She studied public health with a concentration in community health at East Carolina University. Jessica has been at Vecinos for four years and enjoys serving farm workers in the mountains of Western North Carolina. Our last panelist, Dr. Amy Shion, is the president of Public Health Innovators, where she helps the nation's leading health systems, governments, philanthropic and medical organizations, and the tech industry to develop strategies to ensure meaningful and impactful adoption of digital health technologies. After 30 plus year in career in government, industry, and academia, Amy recently completed a senior fellowship at the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, where she championed digital navigation and digital health coaching models. Previously, she led the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine's Urban Health Initiative, where she pioneered the use of mapping to illuminate health and social disparities. Shannon is the research director of the National Telehealth Equity Coalition is an advisory board member of the NODE.Health, the Network of Digital Evidence in Health, and a member of the Digital Medicine Society's Digital Health Measurement Collaborative Community. Her most recent publication is Digital Inclusion as a Social Determinant of Health. Amy earned her BA in Sociology at Cornell University, a master's in public health at University of Michigan, and a PhD in public health policy from Johns Hopkins University. Now I'm going to turn it over to Paula. Welcome everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to highlight the importance of and challenges to digital readiness for farm workers. A recent commentary entitled Coronavirus Pandemic highlights critical gaps in rural internet access for migrant and seasonal farm workers in the Journal of the Medical Library Association states, Migrant and seasonal farm workers who represent a critical part of rural economies and U.S. food systems face health inequities, <clears throat> poor and overcrowded housing conditions, limited access to personal protective equipment and hand washing facilities in the fields, and lack of access to health information. Currently in North Carolina, there is often limited and inconsistent access to internet and cellular service for both farm workers and healthcare or outreach workers. There are many issues associated with healthcare delivery and lack of access to the internet and devices, but today we want to focus on solutions and projects that have been successful in bridging the digital divide. Rosa. First, just to provide some background for our audience, could you explain could you explain who we are referring to when we use the term farm workers? Yes, thank you, Paula. Good morning, everyone. So I'm just going to give a view uh, give a few points about who we're referring to when we use the following terms. So migrant farm workers are those who require um, to be absent overnight or out of their permanent residence to be able to seek employment in agricultural. That's migrant workers. Um, in the United States, most of the migrant workers look like, or they say they're following the crop. So they may start in Florida and then end up all the way to Kentucky, just following the crop per season. So those are migrant farm workers. Within the migrant farm workers, there's migrant H2A. H2A refers to the visa that the United States offers for those that come and work in our fields in agricultural. So those are migrant H2As that come out of country with a visa to follow the crop to the states. 
So there's migrant, migrant H2A. We also have seasonal families and seasonal farm workers. These are individuals that are employed with agricultural work, but do not require them to move out of their home or out of their permanent residence. So they live in the same space for the entire year, but during certain months of the year, their main income comes from agricultural, and those are seasonal families or seasonal um, farm workers. Thank you. Um, now, Amy Sheehan, to start our conversation today, could you explain what digital inclusion is and what are the necessary components to achieve it? Connectivity devices, digital literacy, tech support, and appropriate content. Sure, and first let me just say thanks so much um, for having me. I'm Amy Schoen, and um, uh, it's really an honor to have the opportunity to learn about um, this, this population that really hasn't gotten a lot of attention in the digital health equity um, conversations that I'm in. So hopefully I'll be able to learn alongside of you and, and um, uh, advocate for um, this, this uh, vulnerable population. So um, digital inclusion is about making sure that everybody is able to fully participate in all aspects of life today that require benefit from the internet, like education, employment, and health, um, but also connecting with loved ones, shopping, banking, using uh, government services, et cetera. So um, digital inclusion, isn't just having a device, but having a device that's up to date and fully featured with updated software and security. And a household needs to have enough devices so that everybody who needs to use it at the same time can. Um, and even having devices that are optimized for whatever you're doing. So having a mobile um, device when you're away from your residence and a device with a full size screen and keyboard if you have to do things like um, composing a lot. Um, another key component is connectivity. You have to have reliable, sufficient uh, upload and download speed. Your internet needs to be affordable and available, which of course it is not in many uh, rural communities and also many urban areas. Um, and then there need to be apps that are culturally appropriate and tailored, such as with language choices. Um, and uh, there has to be tech support available um, for people to use their devices, to connect to the internet and use apps. So having digital skills are obviously essential. You need skills for using your device, for using the internet and using um, applications. So I'll talk more about that later. Thanks for that explanation, Amy. So there are various types of organizations that address these issues, libraries, schools, employment and social service organizations, nonprofit organizations, government agencies, telecommunication providers, and increasingly healthcare organizations. You'll be hearing today about how these organizations that collectively comp comprise a digital inclusion ecosystem are or could be contributing to connecting and engaging vulnerable populations, including farm workers. Amy, could you frame the connections between digital inclusion and health? How and why does being digitally connected affect health? So for a long time, um, uh, just looking for information on health was one of the most um, useful things, you know, the ways that people use the internet. And of course, you can also find people who have similar, if you have a disease, you can find other people who have similar conditions and learn from them or get support. And of course, people have increasingly been using wearable devices like smartwatches um, and activity trackers. And um, then, of course, there are apps that you can download onto a smartphone. Now, healthcare has been, frankly, a little bit slower getting into the digital game as far as working with patients goes. But for a long time, they've offered portals where patients can connect to their electronic health records 
um, even though health care systems didn't really promote these, but they've been very, very valuable because patients can use them to check their lab results and communicate asynchronously. So in other words, when it's convenient for the patient, they can send a message, the doctor can respond. And then when the patient has time or has an internet connection, um, they can check again. Portals also offer high quality, trustworthy health information. And um, then of course, during the, the pandemic kind of changed everything because then not only do people need to be able to access healthcare through telehealth, um, which of course requires a device that can have a video connection to have a high quality um, telehealth encounter, but um, patient portals became the main way that health systems would push out information about vaccines um, and let people know about getting appointments and even sign people up. So people who didn't have those portals um, uh, were really being left out. Um, so that's, uh, you know, some of the important connections of digital inclusion for health. Thank you so much. Um, to Jessica and Rosa, what current initiatives are you working on to provide internet access and device to vulnerable populations? What strategies have been working for you and what are the challenges? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Nice to see um, we have a good bit of audience um, and I'm happy to be here as well. My name is Jessica. Um, and so with us at Vecinos here in Western North Carolina, thankfully through um, one of our main grant sites, the North Carolina Farm Worker Health Program, we were able to provide hotspots for migrant farm worker housing units. Um, this started last year due to COVID. As soon as we had the first COVID outbreak, um, we were able to get these hotspots to be able to do these check-ins. The health department was able to do check-ins with um, the migrant farm workers. And then just throughout the season, they kept them because of course they were able to communicate with their loved ones. Um, many of the migrant farm workers, they just have their phone from Mexico. And so it's kind of difficult to be able to um, connect with their family back in Mexico and having connection to Wi-Fi, they can use WhatsApp. That was a main thing. Um, and then another thing was that this year through a partnership with SAF and ECU as well, um, we were able to provide two Surface Pros at a housing unit, um, which is the furthest, furthest um, housing unit from our clinic. It's a little over an hour away. And so it's pretty hard to be able to go out in our mobile unit as often as we wish. And so with these Surface Pros, um, we were able to set them up at their housing location. Thankfully, um, this farm already had Wi-Fi in their housing location, which was a great thing for the farm workers. And so we did not have to provide the hotspots um, for them, but the Surface Pros, um, they were able to, you know, complete telehealth calls. They had something that was you know, able to be moved around to like a private location, even inside the work van to be able to talk to a provider. And then as well, access to health education videos, you know, looking up recipes on YouTube. Um, we bookmarked like main farm worker um, websites, even like legal aid farm worker unit. Um, that way they had those main websites in regards to um, just farm workers, um, they were able to access those as well. Um, and yeah, the main thing is definitely though the hotspots. Um, the farm workers love it. Um, we had most of the farm workers, um, they left like last week and they were already asking, how can I get this in Georgia? I'm going to go to Georgia now and I want to know how I can buy one or even like, how can I get this in Mexico? Because they even have, you know, the same issue here. Um, when it comes to internet connectivity, internet access, it's a huge issue in their hometown, home country. Um, and they're, you know, wanting to have access to this type of device, a hotspot, just because it's um, easy to carry around as well. Um, and one of the main challenges that we definitely saw was just due to living in the mountains and just I would say as any rural area um, in North Carolina, 
internet connectivity is a huge issue for everyone that's kind of outside the like city, town limits. Um, the hotspots work great for those farm workers that are kind of closer to town, but we have a group that um, is up in the mountain. They work in Christmas trees. They live in a very isolated house. And even though the grower provides internet um, and a house line to them, it's still really bad, even for 10 farm workers in one house. Um, so like, for example, the hotspots weren't able to work out with this crew just because, I mean, even when the outreach team goes up there, we have no access. We cannot access our EHR, our phones, no service. So even, you know, when we go out there in the mobile unit, everything has to be done in paper because we have no internet connectivity. Um, and so given that these farm workers live there, um, they actually have already like a little trail that goes up kind of to the tip of the mountain. And that's where they're able to go up there if their phone's not connecting to the internet in the house. They go up to the tip of the mountain and they get a little bit of service and that's how they're able to contact their loved ones. Um, and then thankfully um, they're able to come down uh, as well to see like providers in our clinic, just because we're not able to do telehealth calls with them, just given that there's no service at all. So that's one of the um, most major challenges, I would say, that we've seen um, recently, just given the location of certain migrant farm worker housing units. Yeah, so um, our Initiatives have been, we have two main initiatives going on. One of them is very similar to the one Jessica has with the same partnerships. So we have been able to partner with County Growers, Surrey Communications, which is our um, co local company communications, um, NCFHP, which is North Carolina Community Farm Worker Program. Our farm workers have been our greatest partners as well. Um, we have been part of the county digital inclusion planning committee. Um, we've been working towards inner access, inner and access for Surrey County overall, but um, for our clinic, obviously focusing on our patients and our migrant HOA housing. So we've been able to accomplish um, internet access through hotspots distributions, just like what Jessica mentioned. And in that initiative, the same challenges um, are present, right? So even though I have a hotspot, there may be a housing unit that where the hotspot is just not going to work because it's so rural. We don't live in the mountains like uh, where Jessica works, but we're in the foothills of North Carolina. So we still get some places where um, it's very, very rural and there's no access to any connectivity, no matter what company you're working with or you have on your cell phone. So that's one of the challenges for that initiative. But perhaps our biggest initiative has been able to work on a sustainable plan of internet access for migrant H2A housing. And the way we've been able to do this is to create an infrastructure of fiber connectivity through our partnerships at Surrey Communications and being able to make that happen. Um, I'll talk more about that um, initiative at a later point of the webinar, but the challenge has been for us is um, with all that we do in outreach and farm worker health and just health in general, um, being able to stay up to date and being at the table for county, local and state talks has been a challenge, making sure that we are present and that we are uh, raising our voice and act being actively advocating for our patients, our community, our farm workers. Um, wrapping our heads around the internet issues and terms and fiber and high speeds and megabytes and all of those, it's definitely a challenge. You know, uh, we are in farm worker health, we are in farm worker outreach. So all of these terms are new and that has been a challenge, being able to stay up to date on what that is and understanding really what all of it means. And I see Amy smiling, I think she knows what I'm talking about um, when I talk about all these terms. Um, so that has been the biggest challenge, staying up to date, creating a momentum, both for our county leaderships, for our local leadership, for 
even our state leadership, Amy mentioned in the uh, great experience she has, there has not been so much of a push for this population, for the farm worker population. So creating that momentum where farm workers are now at the table and people are talking and really seeing that, okay, there's a real issue. Um, that has been a challenge to just kind of be in that um, out of the box part says, oh, what about farm workers? That has been a challenge of itself. And um, yeah, so like I said, just wrapping our heads around the whole project, the whole idea, creating momentum and getting our leadership up to uh, speed and what the needs are and um, kind of on the same page that we are. That has been a little bit of a challenge for us. Thank you. And Rosa, currently, what does sustainability of internet access look like for your area? Yeah, so um, again, Amy kind of mentioned what a sustainability, um, ideal sustainability program will look like for our communities nationwide, whether they're rural or urban. So um, having equal access to high speed internet around the county, around the country, regardless of where your home is located. So regardless if you're in town or if you're out in the rural outskirts of the town, right? So that is um, the ideal sustainability in the, the, the plan, right? That's the vision to have equal access for internet across, regardless of where you are. Um, for us, that has been a challenge being in a rural community. Um, it's a large county in land. I think many of us in North Carolina would understand that. So it's a large county when you look at it as far as geographical area, but as far as where uh, individuals live, it may not reflect that same land because we're so rural. So um, I'll have to say with uh, Nancy Dixon, who is our clinic director at Surrey Medical Ministries, um, she joined the digital inclusion committee for the county. Um, and within that committee was uh, CEO Richie Parker of Surrey Communications. That's the local communications company uh, for Surrey County. Um, and talking about the digital inclusion and what needed to be done, um, it turns out the company already had in place a phase strategy to expand fiber connectivity to any remaining areas in the county who didn't already have fast speed internet through fiber connectivities. Well, then within that same time, we were getting ready to start our own farm worker program. Um, we started the farm worker program in May. So we're, our farm worker program is very, very new. Um, but I have been working with farm worker in the past, so I knew the challenges and I knew what had to be done. Um, so as we're getting ready to start our farm worker program and we have Richie Parker, CEO of Surrey Communications, and then we have Nancy Dixon in the Digital Inclusion Committee. We just put all those together and um, the pandemic also was in the middle of everything. And the need of telehealth and access and face-to-face -face was no longer an option. People were feared going to the clinic because they were afraid if they showed up to the clinic, then maybe I will get um, I will get sick because I'm in the place where other people are sick. So I don't wanna go to the clinic. I'd rather pick up the phone or see a provider through telehealth, but how do we give them this option if we don't have the connectivity, right? So everything, all this, the pandemic, Surrey Communications, Nancy Dixon, um, the Digital Inclusion Committee, everything just kind of fell into place. Um, they're just saying in Spanish, nos cayó como anillo al dedo, or like it fit like a glove, right? So all these little things were happening and it just fit like a glove whenever we were uh, making our program. We then um, got involved with NCFHP's uh, internet connectivity project with Natalie Rivera. Um, and between Surrey Communications, the H2A program and H2A farm worker program, um, our clinic and our outreach, we were able to team up together and essentially create a plan or a pilot where um, the growers agreed for us to work in their land and provide internet access for their migrant H2A housing. And their farm or their office 
where they likely don't have internet either to look up and turn in projects for the state. Well, then we got two growers uh, on board who have four migrant H-2A housings. Through communication said, as long as the growers approve, we will do the infrastructure for fiber connectivity at no cost. So then growers agreed, Surrey Communications went in, did all the work, that, that's the sustainability, did the sustainable work to where a hotspot was not what we were gonna do, we were gonna sustain this, where long-term they will have high-speed internet, um, regardless of a hotspot, regardless of the company, they will have that access there. And then they went in and created um, the fiber infrastructure at no cost for the grower and at no cost for our program or NTFHPs. That's what Surrey Communications vision is to have access. So they went in and did that. NCFHP um, with their grants and their projects then were able to reimburse the growers for the cost of the internet access. So our internet bill. So essentially, um, the grower said, yes, come in. Surrey Communications did the digging and the fiber infrastructure. We put in a connectivity, internet connectivity, and CFHP said, we will pay for it. So the grower doesn't have to pay for anything. And then we have happy farm workers with high speed internet connectivity. We have happy outreach staff that can have their EMR on site. We have happy providers that can do telehealth uh, visits with the farm workers at any time. Um, again, happy farm workers that don't have to find transportation or get off work early to go see a provider because they can do a uh, late night visit from their home, from their phone, from their um, from their comfort, right? Um, so everything just kind of came into um, play. We have those two pilot um, farms with four migrant housing, but our idea and our project is to expand this further to the rest of the growers within the county, the rest of the H2A housing, and even seasonal families that may live in the rural areas that don't have um, the ability to have this fiber connectivity. Um, so those were that was our pilot, but our sustainability in our county looks like creating a fiber infrastructure to where everyone has access regardless of where they are. And with our outreach staff being um, exposed to the vulnerable areas and the rural areas, I think we are able to kind of point those areas out to Surrey Communications and then partner up with them so that we can make this happen across the county, um, regardless of uh, H-2A farm workers or not, just in general, our patients in our community that it's lacking um, the infrastructure. So um, that's, a, that's a little bit in a nutshell what our project has looked like and what we've been able to do with that. Okay, Amy, people talk a lot about digital literacy. Can you say a bit about what it is and how it relates to health? Um, sure, but I have to tell you, I absolutely have goosebumps hearing Rosa's unbelievable description of the model they've put together. Um, that is just such an unbelievably fabulous model that I really want to help bring that to attention of, of more places because um, a lot of places would die for something like that. And they didn't even, they wouldn't have even known how to encapsulate the whole model. Having the fiber infrastructure is really key. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. Um, you know, even in urban areas, they think that, oh, we can just give hotspots. But if that fiber infrastructure isn't there, which it isn't in poor urban areas, um, the, the hotspots aren't very good. So, sorry, that was just a little, a little um, digression. And I was also laughing a little bit ago when Rosa went through the list of all those terms that people are unfamiliar with because I'm here in San Diego right now, which is not where I normally live in Cleveland, Ohio, because I was giving a talk um, <clears throat> yesterday to the American Medical Informatics Association, which is people who are working in healthcare and you know focused on health data. And I can't tell you how many people in the audience that I spoke to were not even familiar with a lot of those terms. 
And I'm, I was kind of laughing because, you know, the question to me is about, uh, was about digital literacy. And people think of digital literacy as knowing how to, you know, um, use the internet basically, but it's really so much more that you really have to understand um, all those components about connectivity and then types of subscriptions, you know, um, that, that you can access for the internet and devices and not just how to use your device, but what the capacity is and how to keep it updated um, and the like. Um, my group recently did a survey of um, 30 elderly seniors in a low income, uh, mostly black population uh, clinic in Cleveland. And we asked how many of you have devices, do you have a device that you could use for a telehealth visit? And do you use the internet? And 83% of people said yes to both of those questions. But as it turns out, most of their devices were maybe not even smartphones. And most of what they did on the internet, they said it was texting on the internet through an app like WhatsApp, but they did not do anything else on the internet at all. And so I'm not even sure they understood the question. So it was our bad in how we wrote the questions, but you know, I think there's a lot of things about using the internet that um, you can't assume that people understand. Rosa, or Jessica, then Rosa, what is being done to address digital literacy issues, generally speaking, in your work, and where do you see your opportunities for future training or outreach? Yeah, for us um, here at Vecinos, I still consider it our new mobile unit, um, but we got it last year. <laughs> Um, but it's still relatively new and thankfully with this new one, it's fully equipped um, with, you know, an actual functional um, room, a medical room, but then outside we actually have a TV. Um, so we have something that opens up and there's a TV that comes out of our mobile unit. And so with this, we are able to show educational videos um, and not just, you know, prior to COVID, it was just kind of handing, handing out pamphlets and brochures and growing, going over key points with the farm workers about different health topics. Um, but now we're actually able to, you know, show visuals. Um, and with this mobile clinic, um, we're able to just show different videos about colon cancer, diabetes, um, you know, YouTube just has a huge amount of um, health education in Spanish, thankfully. And so we're able to do that. And with the collaboration with an organization called Hola Carolina um, here in Western North Carolina as well, um, we've been able to create health educational videos that actually is, you know, personalized to vecinos and shows vecinos patients um, giving their um, testimonies. And we have one about colon cancer and then we also are working with one with um, for diabetes as well. And then um, just due to COVID, I think that's when the major switch happened um, to, of course, moving everything electronically and seeing that need. And of course, you know, farm workers being named essential workers, and we all knew that already, but I think there's been more of, you know, advocacy towards farm worker even now more than ever um, about this. And so we even saw, you know, the need of switching everything paper and in person, we had to switch everything to digital and phone calls and WhatsApp and emails and working from home, not even not able to communicate with one another in person. And so that's when we definitely had that major switch um, in the game changer and just being able to work with the patients and send them information that, you know, makes sense to them and they can actually access it. Um, a lot of our farm workers are really young and, you know, they're quick to it on their phone. They're able to access like QR codes and create their like patient portal from our EHR and everything. But then we have our 
older folks that kind of need a little more assistance with that. And thankfully we're able to send them this information for them as well to be able to understand it. Um, and something we'll just continue working on is creating those educational videos. Um, I'm just always working towards being better, um, more inclusive when it comes to digi digital literacy. And also like Rosa's um, whole plan is amazing how they have internet access and farmer unit housings. And it's just something like I even myself hope for um, in the future here in Western North Carolina. And it's it's been a bit more, I think, with us, even like within our office space. Um, we're just now changing our internet because even in our office, it was terrible. Um, our employees had to use hotspots because our internet was terrible. <laughs> and so thankfully now, you know, our office is getting better with internet connectivity. So hopefully farm worker housing um, also is able to improve with that. And of course, with our assistance. Yeah, so um, in terms of what's being done to address digital literacy, generally speaking, um, Amy mentioned, you know, digital literacy is anything from literally the ground up, like how does internet happen? How does it work? There's a lot of work to be done in every single um aspect of literacy, whether it is understanding the infrastructure and how the internet comes to life and how it works, to the users and how to connect to a hotspot, how to connect to your Wi-Fi, how to troubleshoot a hotspot or a router when it goes out. Um, the digital literacy um, education is lacking for all across from my perspective. Uh, we're barely getting our feet wet, right? At Surrey Medical Ministries with this. But my out, the outreach staff needs to be trained on what digital literacy means and includes. They need to be trained on troubleshooting for farm workers and Wi-Fi and hotspots. So they need education. Um, giving out a hotspot and with a Wi-Fi password, with a password and username, doesn't fix our problem, right? That doesn't, the digital literacy doesn't end there. There's so many things Jessica mentioned, our farm workers that we're reaching range from 18 to their 70s. So how do you create an educational model where there's no gaps and both age groups are understanding the same information? Um, I'll, would like to take this time to really, really applaud my outreach staff, but the outreach staff across the state, because the work that we were doing before COVID was already overwhelming and hard and doing anything from helping them um, understand how their mailbox works to really getting them into seeing a provider and probably saving their life. The work that outreach workers do is so, important but it's so diverse and it creates a great burnout because we do so much um and i'm applauding my outreach staff but any outreach staff because if it wasn't for their passion and their willingness to make this work the whole great plan that i have with infrastructure and fiber connectivity would not have happened because i need my staff to be able to go and teach the farm workers how to access that internet that we work so hard to give them, but also access the EMR, access the application to be able to do a telehealth, access um, you know, their app to ask for refills. So the digital literacy is the main component, um, but there is no, there's funding for internet connectivity, but I have yet to found funding or interest in funding digital literacy workshops. Funding our outreach staff to understand how to make this work. Funding, um, like train, to train our staff to then train the farm workers. Everything we've been doing with digital literacy has been what we think digital literacy is and what needs to happen to um, make sure they're connected to the internet. So um, in terms of digital literacy, there's a long ways to go. There's a long ways to go, um, top down, bottom up everywhere I see it, there's a long ways to go. 
Um, but I think these conversations will then begin to spark other conversations. And I hope digital education and digital literacy is part of it. Rosa, could you explain some of the challenges posed by COVID-19 for farm worker health and how the pandemic has affected the usual ways that farm workers got access to healthcare? Yeah, so um, again, like I said, our farm worker program at Zurich uh, Medical Ministries has been moving fiber connectivity fast, right? So this has been moving so, so fast. Our program just started in May um, at Surrey Medical Ministries, our farm worker program. We're here in November and, um, you know, started the program was focused around digital connectivity. This is just something that we adopted after we said we needed to create a farm worker program um, within our clinic. So we have been moving really fast. Um, from my pre previous experience working with farm worker health, before COVID, telehealth was always something that I think our reach staff dreamed of. Um, being able to have the doctor at the farm, but somehow make sure that the doctor is um, comfortable and maybe like a call, a the doctor to be able to take a call or like a FaceTime or um, a Skype meeting with, with the farm worker to where we don't have to provide transportation up to an hour, an hour and a half away, like Jessica mentioned, because of the area that we cover. Um, and then being able to accommodate for the farm workers outside the work hours, you know, I think telehealth was always a dream within farm worker health. But the talks were barely there, but not really there. Then COVID hit. And then like Amy, Amy mentioned, face-to-face -face was no longer an option. People then started working with the EMRs, with their, um, their applications and finding a way to be connected with the patients without having them come to the office. So I think that's the main, the main change. Um, telehealth had then a big push and then the dream that outreach staff already has to make um, telehealth visits to farm workers available just kind of Again, everything just kind of fit into place. Um, the challenge that I have found with telehealth is um, you have to wrap your, your head around it. One, we're, we are a very small clinic. We're a free clinic that opens six hours a week. So we're only open Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we're a nonprofit, we're a free clinic. So our first challenge was one, do we have the option for telehealth with their EMR that we have? because we didn't know, we never worked with it. So then we found that out and then yes, okay, we do have it. How do we access it? How do we, how does that work? So then making sure we understood our own EMR, our own system and how our telehealth is gonna work. Um, two was, okay, we have telehealth, we have access. How do we teach patients how to access a telehealth? And three, how do we offer telehealth to patients that live in um, Brown Mountain Road in Pilot Mountain. And this is a real address in Surrey County. So how do we make sure that Brown Mountain Road in Pilot Mountain has a um, connection for telehealth visit? So logistically, it's been a challenge all around. Um, with COVID, making telehealth was a need and then Telehealth was its own challenge of its own, plus dealing with the pandemic. So everything has been a challenge. Um, transportation um, was, was also something that changed with COVID. Um, before an outreach staff could go and pick up, uh, let's say there was five farm workers that needed to be seen. If you had a large enough vehicle, you put five farm workers, drive them to the clinic, they see the doctor and then you take them back. Well, with COVID, you can't have five people in the same vehicle. So then transportation and the way we work on that also changed and that was a challenge past COVID. Um, and then I mentioned earlier, the trust for patients and farm workers overall to come to clinic um, was a challenge on past COVID because they were um, scared that if they came to clinic, there was gonna be other sick people around them and they could get COVID from just simply coming to the clinic. So trust and 
um, the trust of coming to the clinic was a challenge um, after COVID. Pretty much everything has changed for everyone from one day to another due to COVID. Um, how we view farm worker outreach and farm worker health has changed um, after COVID. How we view patient care as a whole, farm worker or not, has changed past COVID. Um, so COVID-19 has brought in a lot of bad, but I think a lot of good conversations also. Jessica, could you explain why telehealth is so important for farm workers? Yeah, um, a little bit the same as Rosa was just mentioning right now. At Vecinos, we had always had these discussions about telehealth, but not really in depth, just like, oh yeah, telehealth, you know, before COVID, um, just because our outreach team was over capacity, of course, with everything else. Um, in our weekly clinics, we're also a free and charitable clinic, nonprofit organization. So for us, we have clinic in person every Monday and Wednesday evening, and then of course go out in our mobile unit to visit migrant farm workers, um, like sometimes Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. Um, and so once COVID hit, it was like, what's telehealth? How are we going to do this? How are we going to prepare? How can we see our patients? Because of course, um, our clinic was shut down. Um, WCU, Western Carolina University, they donate our office space and um, our clinic space as well. And so when their do doors closed, our doors closed as well. And so um, the first thing was just kind of doing what we could do at that moment, just because we had patients scheduled and everything. And so the best thing we could think of, especially with um, our volunteer provider, he's also a bit older. Um, and so with him, it's kind of hard also doing things electronically. And so it was just doing a three-way three -way phone call, um, the patient, the provider, and the case manager. And so, of course, you're not able to see anything, but we're able to like talk about symptoms, talk about what you're seeing, and sending pictures of if you had a rash. And the provider is able to see that through our um, EHR as well, because we upload those documents. Um, but then, you know, that's not the best way to go with telehealth. Um, and thankfully, we were able to find a source called UpDocs. Um, it's a HIPAA compliant um, video conference um, way that a clinician and a patient is able to use. Um, you're able to do video chat. Um, it's just simply sending a text message to the patient and it's like, click this link and it appears as a video conference. Um, and then it also, in, it goes hand in hand um, with our EHR. You can type up a summary and that's uploaded to our EHR. The video is downloadable. It's um, uploaded into our EHR. And so we have all of that um, secured and it's not just, you know, a three-way phone call. Um, but just overall, we definitely saw the importance of telehealth and farm workers once COVID hit, of course. Um, and we were able to work with the farm workers themselves just, you know, during peak season, sometimes they're not getting home until 9 p.m. And so thankfully with our amazing outreach team as well and our amazing contracted providers, we're able to do those telehealth calls at 9 p.m. or even sometimes 9 30. And even that, you know, was a huge barrier for us when we were going out in our mobile unit because we show up there at 7 p.m. and it's like, oh, we're going to work late until nine. And so it's like kind of a missed outreach evening. But now with telehealth, we're able to schedule these patients, have a video conference with them, assess their issues and then create a follow-up plan. The outreach workers are able to work with them. And then eventually they're able to be seen in person. Um, but, you know, those basic um, check-ins like lab review and just following up on um, their home blood pressures or um, how they're doing with their glucose levels. Those are really easy encounters that we can definitely do over telehealth. And I think the farm workers have definitely seen, seen a game changer in that and um, are requesting now 
requesting now even more than ever to be able to talk to a provider. Um, and then even with COVID, that was a huge thing. When someone's positive, you can't see that person <laughs> in person. And so when um, the farm workers or any of our patients are testing positive, we're able to do those sometimes daily check-ins depending on how bad their symptoms are um, and following up on their you know, oxygen levels and their temperature, um, their blood pressure. And so telehealth has been a huge game changer and definitely helped us out a lot and will continue to help us out a lot. Um, and the farm workers, like I said, are really showing the appreciation towards this um, because now they can easily, you know, follow up with one of the outreach workers and be like, I would like to talk to a provider. Um, and it could just be done so easy and we're not having to then schedule them until like a week later because our clinic in person is booked um, and we can actually do a quick telehealth check-in that same evening after they get home from work. Um, and so it's, it's very important, I would say, of course, for any population, but even more, I think, for farm workers, given just the many barriers they face, like transportation, language access, and just also cultural competency, um, someone who actually understands them. And thankfully with our providers, they're trained with that. And so um, they put the farm workers first and their issues and with being done over telehealth. And it's, it's definitely um, been great to work with. And like Rosa said, COVID has a lot of bad. It's basically all bad, but um, a lot of great outcomes have come out when it comes to health, um, one's health. And so we're super thankful for that. Okay, to Rosa and then Jessica, what has been your experience with providing telehealth services to farm workers? Do people need training to use telehealth and how do you provide training? Yeah, so um, again, a lot of this will probably be repetitive from my last uh, answer, but yes, people do need training. Uh, we had to train ourselves in the process of our telehealth through our EMR. We had to get our medical director on board and ensure he understood how our telehealth visits will work within our EMR, train our outreach staff to train the phone workers, and then our patients, right? Um, train them or show them how to access telehealth. So training all across. Um, because we were and still are very new to this, um, our first visits that we did through telehealth, especially at our fiber connectivity farms, what we did is um, essentially for the first telehealth visits, we had our outreach staff go at the time of the appointment to ensure the process went smoothly. I know the whole idea is to not have to have someone there, but we had to do it to ensure that everyone was understanding that we could see the other end of the telehealth call and make sure it was working. So initially for this year, our telehealth visits, we've had um, our outreach staff be present to troubleshoot and ensure that our pilot is working and that we can then move it to other farms and other farmers who may be a little bit more skeptical about opening their doors to us to make all these changes, right? So um, yes, training has, ha has had to happen. It has to happen. We still need a lot of it. Um, we're hoping with phase two of our program, of our pilot, of our project, that we can have a more streamlined training all across. This year was a lot of figuring out what works, how it works, when it works. Um, what to do, who to call. I'm hoping for next year as the season starts for our H2A workers in migrant housing and we expand the pilot program of uh, connectivity that we can streamline the training and the process of telehealth for the staff, the leadership, and the patients themselves. Jessica, did you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I agree with Rosa. 
it's telehealth is relatively new for us and um, the training, just like Rosa mentioned as well, our outreach workers have to be trained with, um, you know, accessing up docs um, and also getting to know our whole EHR on another level um, and in depth and also the providers themselves, like I mentioned, one of our um, volunteer providers, he is a bit older. Um, and so when it comes to technology, it can be harder for him to access it, access it as well. And so even um, our clinical team, they've been able to do those weekly check-ins with him to make sure he's using the EHR correctly. Um, and then also when it comes to doing those video conferences with patients and to correctly document everything that's being said. And then of course, the patients themselves, this is something new for them because they kind of only knew to see us in person. And so when it comes to telehealth, they're like, oh, oh, you guys can do that now. <laughs> and so it's also letting them know how it's being done and how to access it um, and the way to do it correctly. And so I think there's going to be a continuous amount of, you know, continuous training for our outreach team and the patients and the providers as well. Telehealth is changing, technology is changing on a rapid <laughs> speed. And so we're always going to be in the sense how health is always changing and you're always learning something. I think that's gonna be the same way when it comes to internet and digital literacy. Um, a continuous effort to learn the ins and outs and to be able to put that into play in the rural areas where farm workers live. Um, and yeah, I think um, we'll just keep on going and seeing what bumps in the road come on and be able to bridge those gaps the best way that we can. Amy. I know you are involved in a lot of local efforts in Cleveland, Ohio, but also national efforts to increase telehealth readiness among vulnerable populations. Can you tell us about some mo new models being used to connect people to the internet and to use health applications in particular that we might be able to bring to our state of North Carolina? Um, sure, and I have to say, you know, the things that, that Jessica in particular was talking about, you guys, there, you've got the experts um, right here, but I'll, I'll do what I can um, because I know time is, is running short. I'm going to drop a bunch of links in the chat um, and, you know, kind of walk you through um, what those are. Let me just hit enter on that. Um, the housekeeping is trying to come in and clean my hotel room, even though I have the do not disturb sign out. So sorry about the banging. Hi, I'm, I come back, please. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, I first want to call your attention to a group called the School Health and Libraries Broadband Coalition. Libraries are really, really getting involved with helping people um, with the skills for telehealth and sometimes even setting up um, telehealth uh, kiosks in libraries and um, putting together mobile vans um, in partnerships with health systems. So that's a super helpful organization. Um, next is the um, Telehealth Resource Center. I hope all those um, links came through. Um, that there's a network of telehealth resource centers across the country that are funded by HRSA. So they're focused on community health centers. Um, and um, the one for the Mid-Atlantic that covers North Carolina, um, I've already written stuff up about them because they've got some work with libraries and lots and lots of um, resources, but some of the other uh, regional telehealth centers, I think are specifically working with farm workers. So you might look into um, that, that network. Um, next is the National Telehealth Equity Coalition. I'm their research director and every couple of months they'll publish a story that I'll write that gives examples of things going on in local communities. And the last two stories that I've written both feature some working with libraries around telehealth that I think could be helpful. Um, 
And then finally, um, there's a model called their digital navigators, which are people that help people get who are trained to help people get connected. The National Digital Inclusion Alliance and other organizations have been kind of developing this as a model. Um, and um, separate from that, I found online a training curriculum for training um, digital navigators. So that's the one that's from digitalus.org. Um, and then finally, there's a super, super, super detailed article that's um, with a curriculum that's meant for health systems that are um, bringing on digital navigators. The appendix is the whole curriculum. It's like 130 pages long or something ridiculous like that. Um, but you will find as much information as you could ever want about how to train people um, to do uh, uh, be digital navigators and, and coaches to digital health coaches to help people use digital technology. We also mentioned earlier about the vast range of organizations that can play a role in the digital inclusion ecosystem. Can you talk about how librarians, educators, and clinicians fit into the mix? Yeah, that's what I just kind of kind of answered already that um, librarians have long um, helped people with digital uh, skills and they're not trained specifically on using specific applications, but they're kind of generalists, but increasingly they're realizing that they need to train their staff to specifically help people use telehealth. And so the best arrangement is if a library partners with the health system so that you have someone who understands the telehealth side of it, um, but the people at the library are focused on digital skills. And so when you're teaching someone to use telehealth, you're not really teaching them about health. So you don't really need a health educator as much as you need someone who understands that teaching digital skills is kind of a skill in and of itself and libraries are really great at that. Amy, one last one. What role do community organizations have to play and what are the benefits of partnering with them? Yeah, so um, a decade ago, um, there was, it, during the previous economic meltdown, there was a stimulus program that gave um, millions and millions of dollars to hundreds of communities across the country for um, the Broadband Technology Opportunities Program, BTOP, and that stood up um, a community-based digital skill, digital training centers. Um, across the country and they worked in rural and urban areas. Now, when that funding ended, a lot of those, um, some of those organizations, you know, just kind of disappeared or kind of went back to doing what they were doing. However, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance really got its start then because um, they, you know, kind of took all the organizations that had been active in this field and offered an affiliate network as a way to kind of keep them in touch and, you know, exchange um, best practices and skills and the like. So I really recommend that people join the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Um, it's uh, digitalinclusion.org. Um, it's free. And you can look, they have a map, a network of affiliates that you can search um, on the map and get yourselves listed um, if, if, if you're not already. So they have a monthly uh, call where you can just participate and ask questions. They have a wonderful listserv. Um, they have an annual meeting and they have a webinar series that's been recorded that's sort of like a digital inclusion 101. So I really um, can't recommend them highly uh, enough. And this goes out to all panelists, Jessica, Amy, and Rosa. If there is one thing you want us to know or take away from today, what would it be? Yeah, I can say a bit. I think just technology and internet access in a sense now is kind of essential to our lives. Um, and even more now than ever with everything COVID um, and 
you know, the youth, um, they're now in some schools even requiring like iPads <laughs> for education purposes. And so I think just farm workers and um, the community, the Latinx community overall has a big part of this um, need as well. Um, and thankfully now with um, how COVID affected the community, um, this conversation has been more prioritized. And I think when it comes to migrant farm worker housing, there's of course a lot of places and areas that can definitely improve um, when it comes to just like basic like kitchens and um, like washing clothes location. But I think internet access is one of those key things as well that growers um, and just different farms should also consider. And thankfully, like I've mentioned, there are a couple farms here in Western North Carolina that already have internet access for their farm workers. But those that have yet to put that into play, um, they can, you know, work with programs like Rosa and um, the team over in Surrey County that has been able to provide, because I just think it's really essential for them to be able to access health care um, in general, and then also just be able to communicate with their loved ones. They're here for sometimes 10 months out of the year. And so that's 10 months away from your family and being able to talk to them um, because they're working from sunrise to sundown. And so when they get home, you want to talk to your wife or your kids to feel a bit better um, after a long, stressful day out in the sun. And so I think internet connectivity is a huge part of that to be able to talk to your family and talk to a provider if you have something um, that's going on instead of, you know, being afraid to call 911 or wanting to go to urgent care or to a clinic because you don't have transportation, you're able to just pick up the phone and access a telehealth call with the provider. And so I think that's definitely one thing that here in North Carolina, I see that it's being put into action, thankfully, with like NCFHP, ECU, and SAF, we're having those conversations, but there's definitely a lot more to be done, and I see us working towards that, and hopefully in the near future, we're able to have um, internet access for almost all the migrant and farm worker housing locations. Um, I can I can go next. Um, I think the one thing that I really want people to understand is that digital inclusion is a profound issue of social justice. There are structural and racist reasons that are why the same people who have the worst health and the worst social determinants of health are also the people who have the least access to the internet and that um, aren't developing digital skills because for not for farm workers, but for, for permanent um, residents, that their schools are underfunded. So the kids are not learning um, the digital skills at the same pace as um, more privileged people. And my gosh, that just puts people on um, a very different trajectory for their entire lives. So um, every aspect of digital inclusion, having devices, connectivity, and skills, and support are just absolutely essential um, to have an equal chance in life. Yeah, so <clears throat> for me, definitely highlight what Jessica and then what Amy said. Jessica, um, you know, take away that when we talk about digital literacy and access, we're, yes, we're focusing on telehealth, but it's so much more than telehealth. You're talking about their mental health and their mental stability to be able to stay with their connected to their loved ones when they're out of their home country, their culture, um, isolated, likely working 10 hours, 12 hours a day. Um, you know, digital inclusion and access um, has something to do with their mental stability. Then Amy talking about um, this is a social justice issue. This is an environmental um, 
justice issue and making sure that we understand that. But I also want everyone to um, take away from today that um, it doesn't hurt to ask, right? If someone looks at the project that we're doing and thinks there's no way, it sounds great, um, great work that they're doing, but this will never happen in whatever you are. Um, just know that it doesn't hurt to ask. I mean, find your Nancy Dixon, find your Richie Parker, um, CEO of Surrey Communications, find the one person that will hear you out and start trying to make that connection. It all started with a conversation um, in March and here we are in November presenting about this pilot program. Um, just make sure you, you, you you ask, you make sure you are advocating and speaking up to what you think needs to be done and um, create those partnerships. And just know that if Surrey Medical Ministries free clinic nonprofit six hours a week was able to do it, then um, we all can. We just need to uh, find the right people and speak up and um, make sure we ask and start these conversations. Paula, are you ready for a couple of questions for the panelists? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Mary Roby. I'm Assistant Director for User Services here at Lawfest Health Sciences Library at ECU. And I've got a couple of questions that have come in through the chat or the Q&A. Now, I think you've touched on most of the different parts of this question, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask it. And if, then if you have anything additional to add, um, then you can do that. From the user perspective, what are the barriers that influence their utilization of digital health resources? And are there any concerns regarding the learning curve among different demographics? Well, I guess um, I can take this on. I feel like I've, I've kind of touched on a lot of this. Um, I think that having basic digital skills is, you know, kind of a, a entry point, but you also need the device and the, the connectivity. Um, definitely people, at least in a permanent residence of the U.S., People who have the lowest education um, and the lowest income have the lowest digital skills and the lowest digital access. And we know that using devices is how you learn. Um, and so it's just kind of, it can either be a vicious cycle in a bad direction that if you don't have a device, you're not learning. But, you know, I was hearing a lot of strengths of um, the farm worker population of how um, uh, energetically they're using devices um, and connectivity once they get them and kind of expanding, oh, I did this, now I can do this. That's really the way digital skills grow. So, you know, just having people who can encourage um, your newer adopters and say, you know, to identify, well, what's something else you might want to do on the internet and they're like well i don't know what i could do on the internet you know so it's sort of you got to suggest some things and then help them find something they want to do and support them in doing that and then you move on to the next kind of goal of something you want to learn very good rosa or jessica do you have anything to add to that okay so we have another question. Do you have any suggestions for developing national programs to provide internet connectivity? For any of you who might have an answer. The only thing, I think Amy will probably be the best person to answer this as she's worked more on a um, national level. But if from the clinic perspective and the outreach perspective. Um, I know there are already some funding trickling down to the state and local um, level for um, for connectivity across infrastructure. But I think um, one of the other things that we will have to talk about is um, once we have the infrastructure, also having some 
plan in place to be able to cover the cost of that internet access bill, right? So for us, the partnership with NCFHP and the grants that were available through the state to cover that monthly bill of um, internet, internet bill, um, that was a key component of the project. Um, so I think some across board assistance for um, internet connections and paying that bill will be essential. Um, we all know internet is essential. It's it's in utility within our lives now. So making sure that at a national level, it's recognized as such. But Amy will probably have a lot more to say than that too. <laughs> Yeah, so <clears throat> there have been quite a number of program, federal programs that have offered funding to pay for devices and connectivity, but my I haven't looked at this specifically, but my guess is that they are limited to um, permanent residents and even U.S. citizens, like the emergency broadband benefit bill. Um, on the other hand, the, the infrastructure bill that's currently being um, uh, debated, getting close to passage, hopefully, includes something called the Digital Equity Act um, that is meant to, you know, um, really facilitate outreach to populations that don't have internet and, you know, close um, uh, connectivity gaps. However, I do not know that there has been any advocacy for the farm worker population in particular. So I would be very happy to connect you to the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. They're the ones who have been advocating for this Digital Equity Act for years, and they finally got it included in this legislation. But I don't know that they've it, you know, included this population. But if I introduce you to them, um, it will be on their radar screen and they're in a great position to help. So put your contact information in the chat, I guess, um, if you're interested and I will connect you accordingly. Thank you. Jessica, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I think it's just, um, I see one of the questions is like, how can I volunteer? But I think it's also, in a sense, finding farm worker programs um, near your area, even for us, like Rosa and I are connected with the North Carolina Farm Worker Health Program, which is statewide. Um, and then just from there, you know, they can connect possibly to other states. Um, and just it's like, it's tiers, I would say. Um, and so even starting on the ground since we're pretty grassroots and actually having direct contact with the farm workers themselves and then going up from there um, to work on a national level. Great, thank you. And you started answering that question. Um, if someone wants to get involved with an outreach uh, effort discussed today, how do they go about finding a local organization to volunteer with? Uh, so Rosa or Amy, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I'm putting in the Q and A um, really the what what I uh, put in the chat before. Um, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance has affiliates, um, local affiliates, and also Shelby, the School Health Libraries. Um, broadband coalition. I think they also have a network of affiliates. Um, so look them up. There's also a group called Digitunity that focuses on um, uh, refurbished devices, providing refurbished devices, um, but really high quality refurbished devices. And they have um, also kind of a network affiliate. So I'm going to put the names of all those organizations in the Q&A. Um, sorry, you'll have to Google them to get the URLs in the interest of me getting them in there quickly. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I am, I'm putting those over there, Amy, in the chat to everyone because uh, everyone can't see the Q&A. So I wanna make okay. sure that okay. they get out to everyone. So I'm just copying them in there. I don't see any other questions. Does anyone have any other questions at this time? We have probably time for one more. Oh, okay. Very good. Everyone can see the answer question. So excellent. Just wanted to make sure. 
And Natalie has also put some information in there. And she said she can help with outreach programs across the state of North Carolina. So thank you, Natalie. I just wanna to add to that answer. So uh, if you're within North Carolina and we're good for outreach efforts outside of the farm worker program, which is a great resource to connect people across the state, um, there's a big push in for community health workers across the state to do outreach um, community-wide. So if also connecting with DHHS and the community health worker program across the state, I mean, there's a big, big push with some COVID relief um, grants to uh, include more community health workers, that's another way to get connected with um, outreach. Very good, thank you. All right, Jamie, I'm going to turn it back over to you at this time. Well, thank you um, so much to our panelists and to Paula for moderating the panel today. Thanks to Mary and Heidi for introducing and doing the Q&A for us. Um, we'll be placing these videos on YouTube at the Wapis Library YouTube page, so you can always um, forward that link to anybody else who might be interested in this topic. And we'd just like to give a big thank you to all of our partners, too, for working on this series. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, everybody who is able to attend today. All right, bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Take care. Thank you.